is the founder and director of Cube Root Advisors Private Limited, an attorney with 17 plus years of experience across jurisdictions. Ms. Suhasini shall be addressing on the theme, the call for integration of technology in classrooms. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Am I audible to the last bench? Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Lovely to see all of you here. Uh, some familiar faces, and very happy to have that in the auditorium with me today. Uh, today's conversation, very interesting, integrating technology into the law classroom. Um, there were some very interesting points raised in the previous session, especially by you, sir. I didn't get your name. OK. Uh, about uh, how do we actually teach? Uh, which was a very interesting point, and that's something I want to talk about today. Uh, first disclaimer, I am not an education specialist in any shape or form. Um, also, I think that was a very old profile of mine that I shared. My apologies for that. I, I completed 25 years of my career last year. Um, thank you. Um, but uh, having said that, today's conversation with you is much more of a collection of thoughts and observations that I have been extremely fortunate to gather, having worked uh, with law colleges across uh, two continent, three continents and three countries, um, and across demographics. And this is a very important uh, point, because when we think of law students, we tend to immediately identify and anchor with the kind of law student that we know. It is very hard for the human mind to imagine the variety out there, right? So law students or people wanting to study law, let us call it that. Let us not call it a law student, but somebody who wishes to study the law. Um, there's a huge variety of learners out there, and therefore, there has to be a huge variety in how we teach, right? And that is a conundrum that we can kind of attempt to solve using technology. So my conversation with you today actually builds on something that was shared by the then dean of Stanford Law School, yeah? Uh, Professor Thomas Ehrlich, who mentioned the age of computers in 1973. It sounds quite so archaic and ancient, but it's true. And he said, uh, in gist, it's a lovely paper. It's available on JSTOR for those of us who have academic access to it. Uh, it says, there are two aspects to technology and law. One is in the administration of the classroom, which means your attendance, your marks, your assessments, access to content, things like that. You're ad administering your classroom, right, as a teacher. The other is the impact of technology, or computer-based technology, or I have taken the liberty to expand this further into ICT, information and communication-based technology, and how that intersects with every vertical of law that there is out there. So for instance, how technology has actually forced us to rethink constitutional principles, how technology has impacted the law of contract, how the use of electronic communication is now, has to be woven into our Evidence Act, into CRPC, into CPC, into, um, you know, how do we recognize a bill of lading? How do we recognize invoices? Yeah, all of this. Um, why is technology so important in a matrimonial dispute courtroom? Why? Because it allows for in-camera proceedings with a level of privacy previously unheard of, right? But this dual level of thought that needs to happen is something that re requires, you know, time to reflect. And somebody here mentioned in the previous session that we don't allow our teachers the time to pause and reflect. Because teachers are overwhelmed with the administration of the classroom, that where is the time to think about how we actually teach? Where is the time to sit back and think, 
hey, maybe this case is great to learn this principle, but if I was to go and look for a little video on YouTube, maybe some of my students might relate to that video much better than reading a text on that judgment. And where will that come from? It will only come from self-reflection and self-research, right? So, um, shall we do a little activity? Great, fantastic. I love this positive enthusiasm to do something. So, here's a quick thing. On my right side, which means this lot, I want all of you to individually identify three subjects in law that you teach and how law or how, sorry, technology has intersected that particular subject. Just three. It could be any of the three subjects that you've taught in the past or are currently teaching or want to teach. But how do you think technology has impacted that particular subject? Yeah? Three things. We'll just take 60 seconds to do this. It's a very... And for this lot over here, I want you to think about three tasks that you do in the classroom. I'm assuming most of you are teachers or have at some point taught. In which case, you are well aware of the administration of a classroom. So identify three tasks which you still do manually. Whether it is walking into a classroom and checking attendance, whether it is asking everybody to read a particular text, whether it is asking students to uh, submit assignments, whatever it is. But identify three tasks which are still or which you have had to do manually, physically, in person. Yeah? We'll give it, I don't wear a watch, we'll give it 60 seconds starting now. Easy enough task. You are allowed to collaborate with each other. <laughs> Look, I might have the white hair, but I truly enjoy having fun in the classroom, okay? So this whole session is supposed to be about having fun. That's okay. Good dishes come out of experimentation. I love to cook also. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Great, we have five more seconds left. No, no, five, 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 five. There's that watch. Right, this side, are you ready? Great. Can I have, ma'am, can I have you as a volunteer with the mic? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'll go with the contract first. So in contract now, very recently, we have come up with smart contracts, which is completely with blockchain technologies and all. Okay. So that's there, of course. In contract, uh, there are a lot of, uh, when it comes to practicality, uh, there are a lot of tools which have actually come up in the contract itself. Mm -hmm. So contract, of course, the inter uh, intersection is there. Then I uh, actually go with ADR, that is International Commercial Arbitration, or ADR per se, broadly. Okay. Uh, then in ADR, of course, uh, AI has come into picture. The technologies okay. are there. We are all talking about the revolution of the dispute resolution mechanisms. So uh, the intersection has been there with regards to even the mechanisms of the mm -hmm. arbitration, even the evidence uh, gathering or when we are talking about the cross examinations or anything, mm -hmm. whatever is happening during the arbitration. Uh, we are talking all about ODR mechanism now, Correct. that is online dispute resolution, which itself is a huge plethora, which is coming in into ADR, so that's the second subject. Uh, third subject very recently I've taught is DPDP Act, uh, Indian Data Protection Law, which itself is nothing but a part of technology law, that is data privacy per se. Mm -hmm. uh, so where we definitely say that uh, technology, technology has Technology and there. law. Yeah, Fantastic. So Interesting. Please, please have a seat. What Next. are the technologies being used here? First one would be documentation. Yeah. So communication technology. Second one on ADR was again ODR. So again communication technology. And the third one was the DPDP Act. I would... Uh, Put a pin on that because the act regulates the use of technology while I was looking for more concepts on... Yes, ma'am, please, go ahead. Uh, this is for legal 
fantastic election laws and the impact impact of technology on election laws just yesterday was it that mr altman put out a statement on open ai's interference with global elections in year 2024 just before day was started right fan good catch anybody yes sir yeah. uh, so i was thinking of the lines of the environmental <coughs> environmental law the biggest one that we miss out on right my Tech question to all of you not just here but both sides how many of you while designing your course curriculum have included even one module on the impact of technology in that particular subject that you're teaching i'm not talking about and we have tried this out right we have tried it out with a couple of teams but to answer in the larger scheme of your question of how do we teach and how do we bring technology into our classrooms well substantively we can start by adding one module very simply that puts out the impact of technology on the subject that we are teaching yeah that's one the second one is looking for content that supports the course that we are trying to teach and for that i now come to this section anybody here yes sir on group discussions okay you are still doing that in person fair enough anybody else any other tasks that you are having to do yes sir uh, i teach uh, human rights yes sir uh, and uh, i insist on students going out and identifying an issue of uh, violations fantastic but sir that is a very critical aspect of it i would say that is field research and that should always be retained yeah and that is one area where technology can aid but cannot beyond a point there's a limitation to it uh, but that's fabulous to hear yes sir mediation mediation yes still only face to face we have body language is more important in mediation absolutely so physical form is always better the mediator can sense more in the physical form. in a physical format that's a very interesting point technology cannot really give me an idea of 100% of the communication that is happening that's a very interesting point ma'am you had something to share yes ma'am Yes. So I'd ask the students to apply instinctively to the things so what they are grasping in real life situation they describe in the class. Okay. So classroom interaction. That is the connectivity of the subject to the application level. Okay. Can I just redirect? Could any of you identify tasks that are absolutely essential to running your classroom but which you have to do physically? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we are doing this physically, but I feel technology has to be included. Yes. fantastic so your assessments all your assessments right okay somebody else had a yes sir no i'll come back to him yes go ahead exactly which we have to do So, good learning point. Najid, I'll come back to you on that one. Good learning point over here. We have to maintain a moot court or an internship diary. It's a Bar Council Legal Education Rules 2008 mandatory requirement. There's no escape. Where does it say that it has to be a physical diary? It can be. Unfortunately, that is the exception. It is not practice. So if we were to answer this question of how do we integrate technology into our classroom well it has to be on both levels substantively where we start thinking about the impact of technology in the subject that we are teaching but also administratively make our lives easier i mean it is the ultimate expression of being human the mental capacity to have tools and use them considering that we have the tools and we are not using them let's ram that up a little bit right okay so <coughs> why should i use technology it's interesting that i think anybody here who believes that it is necessary or it is somehow better to do attendance in person like an actual register you know that one which used to have lines 48 lines with p and a and all of that 
Yeah, nobody here. Fantastic. I like the idea that everybody has converted except for the lone dissenter. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the, the exception always proves the rule, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Why should we use technology? And I'm hoping that all of us take this message back to our... Um, yes, sir. <laughs> Valid point. Um, in case we need to make a case before managements, before authorities, before uh, leaderships to integrate the use of technology in processes, I'm right now talking only about the administration of the law classroom. Why is it necessary? It allows for independence. Yeah. It eliminates micromanagement because data is collected and put onto platforms that can be easily accessed by supervisors, by heads of department, by teachers and everyone. It, it changes the dynamic. One doesn't necessarily have to be a supervisor and the data is just there for checking out, right? Impartiality, it's right there, it's transparent. Yeah, it's very hard to fudge numbers on Google Sheets because of the history feature. Yeah, uh, and you need to remember and switch off history, otherwise it will constantly keep doing it. So, uh, integrity. It's very easy to, imp for instance, most of us have either used or, or heard of things like Turnitin or um, a whole bunch of other plagiarism check uh, things, right? They can easily be integrated into either Google Workspaces, Microsoft Teams, or whichever other collaborative platform we choose to use. Inclusiveness. For those who are differently abled, uh, I'm all, I'm, I mean, I could give you the data and the numbers, but it's not necessary since all of us are aware of it. The participation of differently abled professionals in the legal space is less than 10%. So for every 100 law graduates, there are 10 or less who are differently able or recognized as differently able, uh, which makes us an extremely non-inclusive profession, which is extremely ironic considering we are the profession that has to advocate for inclusivity and diversity, right? So the, the, this has to start at home with all of us. Um, and using something as basic as speech to text technology, all of us have it. Audibles, yeah? I'm sure that if all of us could sign the, the petition to have audibles for law books, fantastic. All of us would solve our sleeping problems because listening to that before going to bed is very good for falling asleep. But also otherwise, um, it would be great for anybody who wants to listen and, and is having trouble reading, right? Um, information and intelligence. It's very hard to think about how well your class is doing if you are still looking at marks and assessments on paper because it's not a graphical representation of the bell curve of your class's performance. But that data already on your Google Sheet will automatically show you who needs that extra five minutes of conversation with you to understand the subject a little better and do a little better, right? And early learning principles implemented to enhance familiarity with tech solutions. While she was sharing, Apurvi mentioned, you know, contract management systems. All of us in this room, well, most of us, I'm assuming, are law graduates, which means technically if we were to be registered with a bar council of a state, we would be lawyers, law professionals. How many of us are comfortable using contract management systems? How many of us even know what is a contract management system? But the problem is we have the huge responsibility of teaching contract to that young mind which eventually is going to be assessed on her ability to use that contract management system, right? When a fresh graduate is appearing for an interview, and I, I know a little bit about this because I also work on that end of the spectrum with colleges on placements. Uh, the, the questions that law firms and, and companies are asking is, Hey, how good are you at keeping track of mails? How good are you at managing contracts? 
how good are you at simple filing and documentation version control? Simple version control. These are very simple concepts that can be introduced by teachers during undergraduate study in the classroom. Very simply, when a student puts in their assignment, that is version one. When the teacher corrects it and sends it back, that is version two. And when they correct it and send it again for review, that is version three. It's a very simple concept, but introducing it at an undergraduate level ensures that your student, when she graduates after three years or five years, is that one half step closer to being employment ready, right? So these are, I mean, I'm trying to answer the question that were asked previously as well in this forum. So then the question is, what technology can I use to achieve these aims? Learning management system, our biggest solution, and it doesn't have to be an expensive learning management solution. It doesn't have to be Cameo. It doesn't have to be A or B. It can be something as simple as the email platform that you already use. It can be as simple as Zoom that you already use. Bless you. As long as you are able to keep track of large data sets, as long as you are able to communicate, okay, whether it is instant messaging or mailing, you've got the fundamentals in place to do what you need to do to integrate technology into your classroom experience, yeah? Google Workspace MS365, Moodle-based platforms. Quick show of hands, how many of you have ever used a Moodle-based platform? <laughs> Great. So you know that for the rest of you, for your benefit, you've heard of this term, learning management system? Okay, so the great, great granddaddy of an LMS is Moodle. Okay, in the progression of technology, the first thing that came out was a Moodle-based platform where you can put out content, you can talk to each other, you can submit assignments, and your marks can be consolidated and kept in one place, yeah? Now we have nearly seventh, eighth generation Moodle that's happening. Most of your LMS solutions are based on a Moodle concept, right? Voice to text, I cannot emphasize enough the role that this plays in an excellent classroom experience, voice to text. Most of us might be visual learners. I hope we know what visual learners are. We, we learn by looking at something because uh, visibility is our greatest capacity, human capacity for us as, an in, as me as an individual. But there are people amongst us who are not necessarily visual learners. They are oral learners, which means their focus or they pick up information the most from listening to something, right? Uh, there are also tactile learners, people who learn best when they work with their hands. And we have all sorts in a law college. Um, law as a profession is a text-based profession. There is no escape. You have to know how to learn, read. You have to know how to write. You have to know how to communicate using reading and writing. These three are non-negotiable. But that doesn't mean that our learning also has to be straight jacketed only into these three. Why can we not learn by listening to my book while making notes, right? Both can happen. And the last one, connecting with the bigger world using technology. How many of us tell our students to use YouTube, to use Google, to use um, you know, uh, digital libraries and databases, uh, which is the, the biggest free press uh, that's available, I'm blanking out for a minute. The uh, Project Gutenberg, exactly. Some of the largest collections of information are freely available. How many of us push for access to such databases in the course of our studies, right? We end up being very straight-jacketed in our thought process. It's time to start opening and pushing those boundaries a little bit. So, concern areas. Is it necessary to use technology? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Fantastic. 
sure? Absolutely. I agree with you. We could. So, with, so since somebody has brought up chat GPT, let me address that. There is a lot of debate about AI entering our classrooms. Is it ethical? Should we do it? Should we not do it? Um, first duty that all of us have as human beings, not even as citizens, is to understand what is AI and how it is different from ML. Okay. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are entirely different concepts. What is publicly available right now is AI or ML? Are you 100% sure? Maybe. Most to the Mostly it is ML. Okay, there's very little AI that is publicly available and accessible. Most of it is still being used in R&D in industry or in specialized sectors. For instance, pharma research, uh, heavy machinery, defense comms, stuff like that, right? So what is publicly available is still mass ML. That's one. Our second responsibility as citizens is to know what kind of software is available and accessible to us. And our third responsibility as law teachers or law professionals, I won't call it teachers, but law professionals, is to know where ML can enhance what we are doing, but to know that we need to do the heavy lifting. Chat GPT will only give you the answers based on the questions that you ask. So knowing which question to ask is the key, not the answer, right? Any good lawyer worth his or her salt will tell you this. In a court, only ask the question when you know the answer already. So knowing which question to ask is important. And if you're doing the heavy lifting, then it's, it begs the question, do you really need it in the classroom? Which is why I've left it there. Somebody wants to use it, they're welcome to. It's not necessary, right? You're saying students' creativity thought process mm -hmm. is it solved by using any AI. Because he does not do any work. It's all, and then uh, second part is this is uh, garbage in, garbage out. It tells me a lot of information irrelevant being thrown out. Well, I like your optimism in the belief that students will actually do it because you ask them to use it. <laughs> yes. Is it necessary? I would, uh, I would beg to differ, sir. I have a slightly different take on learning. I would say it is not my responsibility as the teacher to have every answer every time. It is my responsibility to stand up and say, hey, I don't know either, but I'll go and try and look around and get you the answer. Um, and I think that's, that's sort of, because the law is such a massive area, even in contract, I know I was extremely lucky to be taught by some of the leading luminaries of Indian law. Um, I graduate from ILS, so it has its own uh, history. Uh, but um, many times we would ask questions and our professors would ha not hesitate to say, fantastic question, let me think about it, I'll come back to you with an answer. And they would. And we would have much more respect for them rather than somebody who says, why are you asking questions, right? There is that slight difference. Um, Absolutely. And moreover, it is our duty to train the students to think creatively. Yes. And these kind of information which are available, how to catch them and pick the relevant ones. That's more important rather than, you know, because information, like today's media, our times we never had anything. We just had books, textbooks. If the library was not well content, then we had to just choose those books, whatever was available. We never had cheat sheets or answers or. Absolutely. Like, Yeah. But today it's not that. Today, like we have this is when we have to do this internationally. We never had before free books would be like two lakh rupees like that. Yeah, I, I remember. College could afford it. College yes. University couldn't afford it. But today it's different. Yes. It's at the tip of your fingers. So we need to train the students differently rather than. Uh, we need to train ourselves differently to train students differently. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Yes, sir.
what I personally abide by that if it's three weeks, it is difficult in a language. That's what I call three weeks. Okay. So on three weeks, it's quite difficult in a language because technology, as I have written this, uh, our email reminders as effective as uh, physical circulars. If you're putting physical circulars in the class and you're putting an email reminder, the effectiveness of the two and let's say a round by the institution head and uh, this, uh, let's say, video surveillance. Comparison between the two, which is more effective because if you're applying technology early and we are trying to involve, so we want it, if we don't want it, doesn't matter, it's uh, a growing phenomenon because we're still trying to incorporate everything technology per se in our academic and engineering learning. Mm -hmm. But but the point is, if we're incorporating the same in our regional education, then uh, the biggest issue is that ethics. Now we are coming up yeah. with, we're putting everything and then after that, we create. Asking the questions, the solution later. Good point. So I'll, I'll put a pin on that thought because I'm going to address that in a, in a short while. Um, but very interesting point that you mentioned, uh, surveillance. I have very strong opinions on that, so I will keep that out of the course of this discussion. Um, but coming back to <clears throat> something that was mentioned uh, in this last few minutes, Technology is, at no point, please understand, are we saying that you cannot teach well without technology? Not at all. I still believe that the best teaching happens between two interactions. That's it, two people. That's it, okay? You can be a fantastic teacher without even a piece of paper or a pen. And you can still communicate your point. And you can still be incredibly lucky to have a student who understands and is appreciative and takes the information from you and goes and applies it and becomes a fantastic lawyer, right? And is a credit to you. But we are saying that every student may not be like that. And therefore, to make our lives easier, let us try and open our minds and open our classrooms to technical and technological tools that will make it easier, right? Whether it is the administration of our classroom, keeping order, keeping discipline, keeping sense, making sense of the chaos, or whether it is the actual application of mind. What is this technology doing to my area of research? What is this technology doing to my area of study, right? So at no point am I advocating you have to do this. I'm simply sharing some thoughts and observations that I've had in the course of my career. So some people ask, uh, is it too much additional work to do this? On the contrary, I would say no, it makes your life much easier. Use technology to make life easier. Use technology to do tasks that we struggle with, okay? For instance, I, I genuinely used to struggle a lot with keeping attendance timesheets for students. It's a very mundane task. It is not uh, uh, something that requires a lot of mental capacity or physical capacity, but it's just one of those things that I struggle with. I found using Google Sheets to be a, a game changer. It was just so easy to keep attendance, and my attendance was on point, accurate, on time. It was a two-second job, right? So use technology in ways that makes life easier for you and makes sense for the, for the context that you're using it in. Um, what if I don't know how to use these tools? 10 minutes is all that it takes. 10 minutes on a new software. There's enough and more data out there to show every time a new game, a new app, a new software is launched. I'm not talking about highly specialized software for highly specialized professions. I'm talking about public, free or semi-free use content that is out there, whether it's in the Android store, app, uh, Apple store, wherever iStore, it's very, it takes 10 minutes to navigate and find your way around it. So use it, yeah? And uh, capital investment. So this is a debate that's been raging on and on in many circles uh, about push for technology sort of marginalizes a huge strata of our, our society. Why? Because many people do not have access to individual laptops. They do not have access to internet. They don't even have access to stable electricity. Okay, so it is very, um, it's a very first world problem to say use technology. Now the answer to that is 
this requires institutional attention. We need to push our colleges, our universities to move away from those two words in the Bar Council Legal Education rules of 2008, which say every law college will have a computer lab. Yeah, that is it. That is literally the last statement on the use of technology in law, right? And say that if you have a laptop, feel free to bring it to the classroom. If you have a smartphone with a note taking app, take notes in that. If you, ha if you don't have any of that, our college or our university, will, we will try and get them to have open access. For those universities that are so lucky to have interdisciplinary institutions, for instance, if you have an engineering college, a medical college, an arts and sciences, a humanities college on the same campus, you will have access to shared facilities. And if you are a standalone law college, it is not difficult to get into institutional partnerships with the IT industry where there is an easy supply of or access to internet-based internet ICT, right? So these are things for us to think about. Again, how do we teach? How do we bring technology into our classrooms, right? So some observations and inferences. The judicial system has adopted digital devices at every step. There is no escape. You walk into the Chief Justice's courtroom in the Supreme Court, and you see every senior counsel reading their matter off an iPad. Gone are the days where you know, court clerks would haul five and seven bags full of kilos and kilos of files. Those files still exist, but they now exist only for junior associates in the law firms, <laughs> not for the arguing counsel, right? Um, if digital devices have reached there, then it is our duty to make sure that every student who crosses the threshold of our classroom has comfort in using those systems and services. Yeah? Um, when I started my career, I got this invaluable piece of advice, which was you will learn more by spending six months with a court clerk than you would in three years of law. Yeah? And that amazing piece of advice has held me so strong throughout my career because I genuinely did learn how the entire judicial system functions only with those six months with the, the uh, senior most court clerk of the firm that I worked with. Um, but how do we replicate that experience now? We can't because everything has been digitized. It has gone online. So if you don't teach your students how to navigate a court website, how to file online, how to file an FIR online. What is the difference between a zero FIR and an original FIR filed in person? They are missing out on actual employability. They are missing out on the ability to gain, uh, to gain returns on the investment of their law degree. Yeah, these are things that behoves us to teach them. Uh, yeah. We don't actually focus on the integration of ICT into the learning experience. And how do, okay, sitting on an employment panel, I am also an employer, let me give you an employer's perspective. Sitting on an employment panel, if I have two candidates, both from excellent universities with excellent academic performance and all of that in front of me, as equal candidates, the chances of me hiring or extending an offer to somebody who is comfortable using the CMS that I use, contract management system that my firm uses, somebody who is at least aware of what is tally, somebody who knows how to, bless you, retrieve court orders from court websites, they would automatically have an advantage over somebody who doesn't know these things. And how will a candidate learn these? By going to internships. Now, what is the guarantee that they will be taught these skills in the internship? Two students from the same classroom in the same firm will have very different experiences in their internship simply based on which partner or which associate or which matter they are assigned to. One can come back having learned multiple things. One can come back saying all I did for 30 days was sit there and watch and listen. And I got bored and I played Tetris on my phone. Yeah? So we cannot leave education to chance. 
especially when we have the tools to take away that probability and make it a reality for everyone. Standardize the experience. Um, quality of research. Somebody said that we don't do enough research. I 100% agree. But how can we do research if in the eight hours that I as a law teacher am expected to devote six hours of it for administrative and secretarial tasks, which can actually be done in one hour because I have technology to access, right? So we are teaching them how to actually use those resources and those tools. 